Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together once again, and on the ninth day of the fifth month, which is also the 23rd of July, 2022, on the Gregorian calendar. And we finished with the recognitions of Clement last week, and we're going to be starting with the, the book of the, the words of Gad the seer. He was a foreteller or a seer, as they call him, during the reign of Dawid and Shalomo. And while he's mentioned in the common scriptures, his writings are referred to elsewhere, but they were not with the common scriptures. For anyone that's not familiar, there's actually two versions, at least, of the, the book of Gad that's available. One of them is with the collection of some other writings. They say is Ida the prophet and some other ones, but it's quite blasphemous information that has a lot of evil stuff in it. And... It's not scriptural whatsoever, <clears throat> but I actually got that copy before, and the, the gentleman that had published it said, look, if you don't like this stuff, burn it, and after I read that and I realized what was in it, I burnt it because I wouldn't ever give that to anybody either, and it's literally, it's like the uh, pre-Gnostic Gnosticism that it had infiltrated, but um. The other writing was this one, and you can actually look up online and read about how it was found when the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom had went into exile and people were dispersed. Some of them took this book with them and they had had it. Eventually, it was taken to Morocco, I believe, and from there it was translated by the Moroccan Yahudim first. And then we got possession of this in English only very recently. And that's why you can only find, I believe there's one book online in a paperback that has a commentary from a gentleman that's also quite off. But this was a PDF that I had gotten from somebody else that we've adjusted the, the wording, added his name in paleo. And then a little bit of commentary as you'll see as we go, but I haven't finished that yet. So I'm willing as we go through this, it will make a lot of sense. Just for a little reference, again, the time frame is about 1000 BC. It's roughly 2,888 years or so from the time of creation till then, uh, which is at the latter end of it in Shalomo's reign um, that's mentioned in the later part of this book. <clears throat> so without further ado, this is the words of Gad the Seer, chapter one. In the 31st year of King Dawid in Yerushalayim, which is the 38th year of the reign of Dawid, the word of Yahuwah was upon Gad the Seer in the month of Ziv, near the stream of Kidron, saying, Thus said Yahuwah, Go you, gird up your loins like a man, and stand in the middle of the stream, and cry in a great voice, tarry and hasten, tarry and hasten, tarry and hasten. For there is yet a vision for the Ben Yeshai, or the son of Jesse. And during the cry, your face should turn to the east, east of the city, and spread forth your hands toward Shemaim. And I did according to what I had been commanded. And it came to pass when I finished calling that cry, I opened mine eyes and saw a yoke of oxen led by a donkey and a camel coming up from the stream Kidron, the donkey on the right side of the yoke and the camel on the left. <clears throat> and a grace voice was going before them like a roll of thunder, crying in a bitter voice, saying, seer, seer, seer. These are four mixtures that confuse the people of Yahuwah. For the impure and the pure have been mixed, and purity has been put under the hand of impurity, a mixture from Seir to rule over them, to increase power over a righteous doer, and thus to betray, to destroy Kodashah, to crown inequity, to set up matters of impurity in the guise of purity. And after the voice came a great shock that shook over the impurity 
and blew away the donkey and the camel into the moon with a stormy wind. And the moon was opened and looked like a bow, a semicircle, and both her heads reached the ground. And behold, the sun came out of Shemaim in the shape of a man, with a crown on his head, carrying over his shoulder, or sorry, his right shoulder, a lamb rejected and despised. And on the crown of his head were three shepherds are seen shackled with twelve shackles. And these shackles were of gold coated with silver. And the voice of the lamb was heard great and dreadful, like the voice of a lion roaring over his prey. Woe unto me, woe unto me, woe unto me. My image has been diminished. My refuge has been lost. My lot and destiny has turned me over to my spoilers. And I was defiled until evening by the touch of impurity. And it came to pass when the voice of the lamb was over, and behold, a man dressed in linen came with three branches of vine and twelve palms in his hand. And he took the lamb from the hand of the sun and put the crown on its head and the vine branches and palms on his heart. And the man dressed in linen cried like a ram's horn, saying, What have you here in purity? And who have you here in purity? That you have hewed for your or you have hewed yourself a place in impurity and in my covenant that I have set with the vine branches and palms. And I heard the lamb shepherd saying, There is a place for the pure, not for the impure with me. For I am a Kadosh Elohim, and I do not want the impure, only the pure. Though both are creations of my hands and my eyes are equally open on both, but there is an advantage to the abundance of purity over the abundance of impurity, just like the advantage of a, sha of a man over a shadow. For the shadow does not come except by man, and only by the existence of the man is the shadow given to the tired and exhausted, to pure and impure, this matter is even so. For all gates of intelligence are turned round since the death of the eight branches of the vine, as is found in words of righteousness in the true book. But because of the wanderings of the sheep and their rest and divisions, intelligence is stopped up until I do greatly in keeping favor. And I saw that impurity was driven from the moon and was given to the hand of consuming wrath, ground finely to dust and scattered by the daily wind. And the day burns as a furnace to transfer impurity and to erase the transgressions. And the lamb was put on the moon forever and ever. And the lamb took of the pure that had been mixed with the impure and brought it as a shalom offering sacrifice on the altar before El Shaddai, jealous Yahuwah of hosts. And I heard the sound of the song of the Lamb, saying, I shall give thanks unto you, Yahuwah, for though you were angry with me, you relented. For Yahuwah is my strength and song, and he has become my Redeemer. I will sing unto Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea of reeds. Rise up intelligence, rise up power, rise up kingship, rise up majesty and esteem, rise up to help Yahuwah. For El has delivered one who had strayed and obliterated the impurity from the earth. He fought my fight and brought into the light my righteousness by his help. My help comes from Shaddai, who made Shemaim and earth. Amen, who is like unto you, esteemed in set apartness, but not in impurity. For you are great over all, 
raised over all. You spoke and acted. For you declared the end from the beginning. You sealed everything with your words and turned my heart and tormented me. For your seal is on me, my master. And these three branches of vine are the twelve palms, or sorry, and twelve palms that are on my heart. You gave me grandeur. You erased vanity to fear man. You gave me a pure heart forever. For that I will praise you at all times and thank you among the nations. For you have redeemed me greatly for my king and did favor Dawid, Hamashiach, and his seed forever and ever. And I heard a voice crying from Shemaim saying, You are my son. You are my firstborn. You are my first fruit. Have I not brought you from the crossing wholeheartedly to be my daily delight? But you have thrown my presence away and dressed up the impure with the pure. And that is why all these things have happened to you. And who is like unto you among all creatures on earth? For in your shadow lived all these, and by your wounds they were healed. For that, consider well that which is before you. And because you have fulfilled the words of the shepherd all the days you have been in the sun, and you did not leave them, therefore all this honor shall occur to you. And I, Gad, son of Ahimelech, of the Yabaz family of the tribe of Yahuda, son of Yisrael, was amazed by the scene and could not control my inner being. And the one dressed in linen came down to me and touched me, saying, Write these words and seal with the seal of truth, for Ahie or Ahia, Asher Ahia, I am that which I am, is my name. And with my name you shall barak or bless all the house of Yisrael, for they are of a true seed. You shall go for yet a little while before you are gathered quietly to your fathers. And at the end of days, you shall see with your own eyes all these things, not as a vision, but in fact. For in those days, they shall not be called Yaakov, but Yisrael. For in their remnant, no inequity is found, for they belong entirely to Yahuwah. And these words will be unto you a restorer of life and ruach. And this shall be the token unto you. When you enter the town, you will find my servant Dawid while he is reading these words from the book of the covenant. And yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am Yahuwah, their Elohim. And you shall tell him about the scene you have just seen. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. And it came to pass, when I came to the house of Dawid, the man of Elohim, I found him as the one dressed in linen had said. And I told him of all my visions. Then Dawid spoke unto Yahuwah the words of this song, I love you, Yahuwah, my strength. And to me he said, Baruch are you to Yahuwah, that disclosed his secret to your ears. And I lifted my voice, saying, Baruch are you to Yahuwah, that did not remove his covenant from you, for he is true, and his word is true, and his seal is true. All right, just one moment. <clears throat> All right, and then that was chapter one. We're going to go back now and go over it in detail and look at the footnotes. And also I'll cover things that I haven't written down yet. Just so you can see how well this actually seamlessly lines up with the rest of what's in scripture. Okay. The 31st year of Sovereign Dawid in Yarushalayim was the 38th year of his reign because he reigned for seven years in Hebron, if you recall, over Yahuda alone. 
and then was brought over the rest of the children. <clears throat> this right here mentioning the month of Ziv might be an interpolation or where they'd put a later thing because they got these names for the months or the moons after the beginning as far as I wear. And it, they didn't call it this during Dawid's reign. I could be mistaken, but you don't find that anywhere throughout the common scriptures until after the Babylonian captivity. Right. So right here, the first footnote, I mentioned that he says, Terry and hasten three times for emphasis, right? And he's facing the east, having to do certain things a particular way in, in the Wadi Kidron. If you remember, the Wadi Kidron is where our Mashiach went when, with the garden Gethsemane when he was praying. It's also where Eliyahu went when he was fed by the ravens and he was hiding from Ahab. There's a few other things where it's, in, it's a significant place. Um, anyways, the, the first part, he says Terry and Hasten three times for emphasis, just like he's mentioned in, as we see right here, the first mention for something like that was by Yahusuf. When Pharaoh had the dream where he saw it twice, he told them that you saw it twice because it's surely going to happen. And it was being confirmed to him. Just like it established later, there's one witness does not confirm a matter, but two or more. That's the way our Mashiach worked from the beginning, as you can see. But the uh, it's also alluding to the three ages, if you will, the Tarian Hasten, Tarian Hasten, Tarian Hasten, which is just like the parable you can see in Luke and Matt, Matt and Yahu right here with the woman who hid her three measures of leaven until in three loaves until all was leavened. And he directly tied that, excuse me, he directly tied that to the reign of Elohim and the Malkuth Shemaim, if you will, the kingdom of heaven or the heavens. So the uh, how that ties in, if you're not familiar, Everything is in parables and foretelling happens in a micro scale and then a larger scale. With Abraham, it was the children of promise being called out and given the word and walking in belief before the circumcision and before them they're going into the land. The where he sojourned, the things that happened to him would happen to his children in a larger scale before they were fully in the land with their inheritance. Yitzhak was the promised seed, born on the 15th of the third month. That was a foreshadow of the same, who always stayed in the land, was ever obedient, and was given the baraka of a hundredfold, right? And it represented the children while in the land and doing his will. And then Yaakov, which if you recall, we just read in the recognitions of Clement, Kepha had said that our Mashiach in particular was emulating Moshe and Yaakov in his first advent. And Yaakov represented when he went out of the land to labor for his children, for his family and those uh, his possessions, and then to return, having them remove the idolatry, make themselves clean to come keep the feasts in the seventh month, right? And that's all, you can see these things very clearly in Yobelim, where it gives you the dates and gives you the days, the institutions of the feasts that are mentioned in the common scriptures, you find their foundings with the patriarchs in Yobelim. So the two really go hand in hand. <clears throat> but just to set the reference for, for what's being spoken of here, and I'll give you a little background. This is a vision of the advent of our Mashiach and then what would happen after he came. So as we go, you're going to see those conditions are being met, right? And that's why it has the three Tarian hastens first, because it's during the time of the Yaakov, the Yaakov uh, fulfillment of history, if you will. It says, and he was obedient. He did what he was commanded. And because of that, these things happened. And it says, and he opened his eyes and he saw a yoke of oxen led by a donkey and a camel 
coming up from the stream of Kidron, the donkey on the right side and the camel on the left. When you look at that, I'll just read the commentary here and then we'll talk about it. It says, the donkey alluded to throughout scripture, first in the character attributes of some of the giants, then in Yishmael and his children, is a type and picture of the original covenant believers established at Mount Sinai. All right, and that's specifically the donkey. The first reference to the donkey you can find in Hanok or Enoch chapters 86, 4, and then 89, 6, 11, and 13. The first reference is with the Nephilim and then the giants. You actually have the elephants, which would we, we would call as the titans, the, the children of the watchers and the women. Then you had the camels, which would have been the children of those titans. And then you had the donkeys, which were the children of the, children of the uh, camels there. The three steps of giants that are mentioned in Yobelim, Hanok gives in parable in that form. The next reference in the animal apocalypse of the, the donkey is with Ishmael and his children, which is 89, 6, 11, and 13. All right. Then you have it mentioned that he, Genesis 16, where he says, Our Mashiach appearing to Hagar at the well is foretelling about Ishmael being a wild donkey of a man and his hand against all his brothers and every man's hand against him. Then you have the reference of the donkey in Yob. You have the illusion in Exodus where it says that every donkey is redeemed by a lamb, and if you don't, you break its neck. Numbers 22 with Bilam, the, the false foreteller seeking carnal gain, who's corrected by the, a dumb donkey, which is an allusion to the things at that time. If you recall, our creator is the truth, and he can only reflect he can only do of himself and reflect what is real and true so this might not be a concept that you can have firm in your mind just yet but i want you to think about this okay his children he alludes to as stubborn donkey or horse in the wilderness that he had to steer because they would not come to him willingly but like with a bit and bridle they had to be forced and, and coerced into doing what was right and that's where you get the illusions of that throughout the Psalms and other places. Uh, and then you can see right here as well. In the foretellers, the donkey, the wild donkey, the promenary or on in the wilderness and what they're doing is alluded to. And then also in Kepha. But right here, this is the key. This is the key in Galatians. In Galatians 4, 21 through 31. Shaul is giving a parable of the, the conditions of where they were at based on the life and the, the ways of the patriarchs. And he specifically says that Hagar is the original covenant at Mount Sinai, meaning that her children, Yishmael, would be the children of that first covenant, tying that connection together. And that's how you can get the donkey being alluded to as the first covenant believers. Tying it back in with um, Bilam, just so you can see the connection there. He was a false foreteller. He was looking to gain, and he went to the children who were stubborn and not walking correctly, but he was corrected by them. And so he was corrected by a dumb donkey because it's a reflection of the truth, okay? As we go along more, and I really encourage you, check out every one of these verses, read them in context, get the whole you know, sense of it, but then look at what it's alluding to in foretelling, specifically what's mentioned here, and then tie it back in with the rest. Camels are those who chew the cud, but do not have a split hoof completely divided meaning they meditate the word, but do not have an expectation in the next life. And you can see that 
in what was called the Book of the Giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was also found, it was known outside of that in fragments from other languages, but it was found within the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Hebrew. It's only in fragments as well, but you can see in there the uh, giants, the different levels of them, they received visions, they had dreams, they were having, they were very interested in knowing what would be. They sought Hanok for the interpretation of those things in them. And so they, they chewed the cut. They were meditating these things, but they did not have an expectation for eternal life because of what they had done. Okay. It says, they are first mentioned as the second class of the children born of the watchers the first generation born of the giants themselves, what we would call the children of the Titans, but they directly allude to the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes who deny the resurrection from the dead and amass wealth in this life, add to his word and forsake the commands for tradition and work falsehood in translation. It is well worth reading through all Yahushua, or all Yahushua has to say on this topic, but see Leviticus 11.4, Deuteronomy 14.7, Yeshayahu 21.7, Zechariah 14.15, Matthew 19.24, 23.24, Mark 10.25, Luke 18.25, and the Epistle of Barnabas 9.16 through, and that should be 21, I think, or 20, but I'll have to check again. And all of these show what the camel represents in scripture. The, um, the tie-in for that might not seem as clear, but you have the camels, right? They chew the cud. It's just like the Pharisees. They meditate these things, but they don't have an expectation of life. They deny the resurrection. They, they do all the things that you find are the mannerisms and characteristics of those original individuals because those demons are in them influencing them. That's how that is working, all right? And that's what the allusion to the time when our Mashiach came is manifest because you have the donkeys and the camels that are yoked to the oxen or the remnant that's walking correctly. And this is a, a mixture that confuses the children or the people of Elohim, which is exactly what was going on at the time when our Mashiach came. So Ab willing, that will start to make a little more sense as we go along, okay? <clears throat> but that was just the rundown for the conditions of when he was coming. And now you see, and a great voice was going before them like a roll of thunder, crying in a bitter voice saying, seer, seer, seer. These are four mixtures that confuse the people of Yahuwah. For the impure and the pure have been mixed, and purity has been put under the hand of impurity, a mixture from seer or Edom, to rule over them. Mount Seir is Edom. It mentions that in a few places in the common scriptures. That's why I, I put Edom right there. But that was the allotment that was given to the children of Edom, Yaakov's brother. Born in the womb with him, given covenant promises, but selling his birthright for naught, and persecuting who he should love hating from the heart his own brother that was born in the womb with him. And it, for everyone that doesn't know, Edom, just like Yishmael represents the first covenant believers, Yaakov was when our Mashiach came to get his renewed covenant believers. And when he went out to, to give the, the Malkuth to the nations, if you will, and what was born in the womb with that, that rose up against and, and ended up being a persecutor of his brethren that should that he should love was Rome. Rome was the assembly that later went perverted and is persecuting his brethren, which was what was represented by Edom. I don't have that in the footnotes here just yet, but you can see this very clearly when you look at this writing here, especially chapter two. And then you can tie it in with all the parts in scripture, including in the Psalms. There's a Psalm that talks about uh, when they ask for a song, 
and they threw their harps up into the, the trees in Babylon and said, how can we sing the song of Zion in a foreign land? And it mentions what Edom had did to them. And it says they need to return to the daughter of Babel, what Edom has done to them. And dash by dashing their little ones against the rock. Not literally killing children like was done with the enemy, but having them be broken at the foot of our Mashiach, the truth of his word, right? So you can see it alluded to in the Psalms there with Edom and Babylon. You can see it alluded to in the Gad the Seer here, this chapter and the next one most clearly. You also have in Josephus and the Dead Sea Scrolls that really tie it together. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have what they call the Peshars or interpretations, commentaries, they call it, if you will, of the different foretellers, which were literally the Kohanim, the sons of Zadok, would take the foretellings, write out a verse, and then write the interpretation of it and what it meant in fulfillment which is very amazing stuff when you actually take the time to read it. In there, they equate Edom with the Ketim. And they equate the Ketim with a people who will pillage and conquest and worship their, their war standards, which is exactly what Rome did. Ketim is mentioned in this next one as Edom in chapter 2. And then you also have the fulfillment of their worshiping their standards that's mentioned in the Peshars of Amos in the Dead Sea Scrolls, spoken of as fulfilled by Josephus in the War of the Yahudim after the sacking of Yerushalayim and the Temple, or Hekel. They literally worshiped their standards right there. In fulfillment to what was foretold in Amos and expounded on in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's a literal chain it's one step at a time that makes it unequivocal, without any doubt whatsoever, who's being spoken of, that Rome is absolutely with Edom in the foretelling sense, just like Yishmael is the original covenant believers. Hagar is the first covenant at Mount Sinai. Sarai having her child later, the promised seed, is the, the renewed covenant. Okay. And this is the purpose of it, right? To increase power over a righteous doer and thus to betray, to destroy set apartness, to crown inequity, and to set up matters of impurity in the guise of purity. This was what was happening in a micro scale at that time with, with Edom and how they were plaguing the children, but they were put in subjection by Dawid when he subdued the nations, if you recall. It, when our Mashiach came, though, Edom was ruling over them. If you, re, if you remember, it was the foretelling that was given in Genesis by Yaakov that a lawgiver would not cease from Yahuda until Shiloh comes. Shiloh comes, and to him is the obedience of the nations. The Maccabees were of the sons of Louis from the first order of the sons of Zadok, Yahu Yarib, Yahuwah will contend, is the name of the Hashmoneans, okay? But they were intermarried with Yahuda and able to reign in that capacity. Just like Te Taffy being of the line of Dawid, married the Hermon in Ireland, who is the largest landholder of the sons of Zerah of Yahuda, but not from the line of David or Dawid. And her children were able to be of the seed of Dawid reigning over Israel and passing it down through the mother's line. That's happened multiple times throughout history. And that's also why you can see in places like America, just like after the Babylonian captivity, they didn't have a king, but Yahuda had a governor over them. After the mystery Babylonian captivity of the Dark Ages, with the Reformation, you had the popular governments pop up and no more monarchy over the children. But it was still the seed of Dawid that was reigning. And that is literally true for America and other places. But the throne would not cease from over the children from the seed of Dawid. And that's culminated in the English 
throne, which will never be done away with until our Mashiach comes. So there, there's a lot of things going on. It'll make more sense as we go there, but I'm trying to give a little bit of background, okay? Um, anyways, you can see as they came out, some of the people that served as presidents were of the sons of Louis as well, not all Yahuda. And you can see that, but anyone can look up and find out that all the presidents are related, right? They have... Um, They have uh, a 12-year-old girl a few years ago put up a, a thing where she showed all the presidents were related. Even Barack Obama, the Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, for example, were the same distance away in relation. So either one of them could have been given that position. But um, predominantly, it was whoever had the strongest bloodline tie got the position throughout our history as our nation. And you can look that up. It's kind of eerie. However, some of them, like James Madison, had an I haplogroup group as his dominant, which is of the sons of Louis. Others, and most of them have R1B, which is related to most of the monarchs throughout Europe and the world. And that's literally the seed of Yahuda. You can also find some I haplogroup group monarchs in Ireland, and Scandinavia, throughout history because of the example you see in the land. Yahuda and Louis intermarried, and you had some of Louis reigning as well in positions of authority. You see that outside of the land on a larger scale also. I want you guys to keep that in mind as well. What you see happen in the land is a microcosm for world history. And right here, this was foreshadowing what would be in the dark ages the purpose of what they were doing to increase power over a righteous doer and thus to betray what the nicolaitans brought in to destroy set apartness to crown inequity and to set up matters of impurity in the guise of purity which is exactly what the amalgamation and adoption of all those pagan practices is right all right now that you have a little bit there, we'll continue. It says, and after the voice came, a great shock shook over the impurity and blew away the donkey and the camel into the moon with a stormy wind. All right. And the moon was opened and looked like a bow, a semicircle with both her heads reached the ground. The moon I've talked about before, but we'll go ahead and read it here and then I'll i show you how else that ties in together. And this is something that I only recently saw. What the semicircle means and both horns or, or both heads reaching the ground, I never really got until very recently. So this footnote says, the moon represents the Malkuth Shemaim, the reign of the heavens, alluded to from the creation account on the fourth day the sun, which is the light of the world and represents our Mashiach in parable form. The moon representing the kingdom of the heavens or the Malkuth Shemaim. And then the stars, which are the children of light running the course set before them, who knows him who names them and shows forth him who numbers them. That was the things created literally on the fourth yom of creation. And that was what he worked in creation and history at that period of time when he came. You can find, uh, let me finish reading this. I didn't finish putting the footnote, but we'll, we'll cover that. It says, it was built on the fourth yom of the creation week. It is tied to the earthly kingdoms, the moon is, right? And to Yahuda, then Dawid, and unto his children specifically even to signs seen during the Middle Ages and later that are directed to the seed of Dawid and the reign or kingdom. And I mentioned, see Genesis 37, 9 through 10, which is the dream that Yahusaf had, where his father was like the sun, his mother was like the moon. 
and that was pointed out by Yaakov in the interpretation. The next reference, that the moon being like the mother, what you live and inhabit, okay, it's like the kingdom or the city. These are all different pictures of the mother, also the world in general. But the next reference is in the Testament of Naphtali, part of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, where he had a vision, and in his vision, the sun and the moon are taken possession of by Louis and Yahuda, respectively. Louis taking hold of the sun, like the light of the world, is given the kahuna, who's to give the light of truth unto the children of men. And Yahuda was given the, the rain, the earthly kingdom, which was representative of the moon. Then you have the testament of Yahuda, where he talks about how he would be. You also have, <clears throat> and that Yahuda and then Dawid would get the rain is made very clear. Promises in Genesis and Yobelim were given to Abraham that not only would he have a, a seed, but they would be rulers in the earth. And kings of nations would come from Sarai herself, which her name was changed to princess because only a princess can beget kings. And then from Yahuda, he had the Testament of Yahuda, where he talks about how his children would be involved in lewdness and witchcrafts and be like sea monsters on the sea, which is a very telling thing. But I, I encourage you to look at that as well. It doesn't directly tie into the moon, but you can see what his people would be like. And then when you tie that into the condemnation against landlords, kings, and rulers that's in Hanok chapter 105, I believe, or the end of the book of Enoch, that condemnation is against Yahuda's children for the things that they did. The next allusion to the moon, a reference to it as the kingdom, is in the Psalms. I believe it's Psalm 89 or Psalm 72. You have a few of them where the perpetuity, the per perpetuity of the kingdom would be like the moon for the seed of Dawid and established forever. And you can see that fully culminated when you look at the genealogy, I believe it's in Mark of our Mashiach, where it goes through 14 generations from Abraham to Dawid, from the crescent to the full moon, if you will, and then 14 generations from Dawid to the Babylonian captivity, from the full to the dark moon. And then again, 14 from the return to the coming of our Mashiach, exactly in line through their generations with the cycle of the moon in, per, in connection with the kingdom. Outside of what you can see in the scriptures right there, you find in the book of Revelation, and you can find this in the Antichrist for Dummies videos or the Anti-Mashiach for Dummies videos on YouTube from the channel christmasisalie.com. And in there, you'll discover that during the Dark Ages, when the monarch of England was tried for crimes and beheaded, he had a lunar eclipse over him at that time. Other times, there was stars breaking up that they had learned not to do things. But the moon and things happening with it directly ties in with what's happening to the earthly kingdom with the seed of Dawid reigning over them. And perhaps anyone who's listening to this and thinking about the blood moons that we've been having in this country and the solar eclipses making an X, yes, this directly ties into those things and judgment against us and what he's trying to point out. But you have to take what he said in his word to apply it to reality and not just make things up, which is what I'm trying to show you from right here. All of these things are, are plainly written, and then you extrapolate. That's all I'm doing. <clears throat> but when you get back here now, and it talks about the great shock shook over the impurity and blew away the donkey and the camel into the moon with a stormy wind, this is the condition where 
the donkey and the camel. You had the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees with Edom ruling over the moon. There's contentions there and fighting, stormy wind. If you can recall, or if you don't know about these times, the best place to find it is in the fifth book of the Maccabees and the antiquities of the Yahudim and the war of the Yahudim. Um, the antiquities is Josephus' larger writing. It takes place from creation until around the advent of our Mashiach, but doesn't, doesn't go all the way to the destruction of the Hekel. In the wars of the Yahudim, it takes place from the time of the Maccabees with Antiochus Epiphans, all the way through to the destruction of the Hekel, and then even after that with the, the battles at Masada. If you don't know, after the Yerushalayim fell, the rebels that had left were chased until they got to a stronghold, and then they were eventually taken out there. But that's the condition that you had here. Oops, sorry. Edom and the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees, all in positions of uh, contention with each other in rulership over the people. And it says, and the moon was opened and looked like a bow, a semicircle, and both her heads reached the ground. That part I didn't get for a while. Didn't have any idea what it meant. I, I thought for a bit it might have been something about Islam, especially based on the commentary that was in the paperback version of this writing. But when you look at the history of what was going on here, before Herod took over, there was contentions about who was reigning. Alexander Janus had a wife and he was very, he was the one that called himself a king. First crowned himself, he was a king, high Kohen and a foreteller. Uh, or maybe that was his father, I don't want to mix things up. But point being, he contended with the Pharisees a great deal. It's mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the Lion of the Wrath of Yahuwah, the Lion of Wrath. And he impaled or crucified, if you will, hundreds of the Pharisees at the time because of what they were doing. And they were in constant bitterness and fighting with each other. But because of that, when he was at the end of his life and dying sick, he told his wife to, if you want to keep the kingdom, capitulate to the Pharisees. Do such and such a thing. Let them do what they will with my body and they'll treat me well and they'll keep you in power. And that's what she did. But they got authority. They started persecuting their enemies and, and instituting their traditions of men over the word. And that's how that got a foothold. But um, her children, when she was taken out of the way, started contending for who she gave the high kahuna to her eldest, but the youngest was taking over the position of ruler. And after that, uh, she had passed away. The younger rose up and took over from the elder and ran him off. And it was, it was working for a while, but a gentleman who was an Edomite named Antipas was talking to the elder, convinced him to try to get his position back. And it was through his machinations working with, I believe it was first with the Arabians, the Ishmaelim, and also with Rome, who situated themselves to get him repositioned. Um, eventually, the, the brothers are still fighting and contesting. There's issues between them. The, the one that's serving in Har Harkanis, the one that was serving as High Kohen, got captured by his brother when the Parthians came in. They cut off his ears and nose so that he could never serve again. And this is the, uh, the fighting, the infighting and bitterness and evil, brother against brother, that had the moon with both their heads reaching the ground because they were the two that could have reigned, but they were both not doing what they should. And this is the literal conditions that were in place when our Mashiach came they lost their authority eventually it was given to antipas to be the ruler and then his son herod was given the kingdom by the romans and that's when you had the mixture that was brought in from that point 
And it was once he received the rain that the foretelling was culminating in Genesis that said that a lawgiver would not cease from Yahudah's from between his feet until Shiloh came. Shiloh came. And that was during the reign of Herod. When he was a man later in his life, soon before he died, our Mishiach was born, right? So it says, and behold, the son came out of Shemaim in the shape of a man. This is our Mishiach, the light of the world, with the crown on his head, carrying over his shoulder a lamb rejected and despised. So the offering he was bringing, which was also himself, right? And then another thing you're going to see here is the man dressed in linen who called himself Ahiah Asher. Ahiah is our Mashiach. So you have him manifested in multiple different ways in a vision to someone. And that might seem a little odd, but all you have to do is carefully pay attention to what's in the original covenant writings. You have a man appearing as Elohim and the esteem of Elohim and other things talking and no one's ever heard the voice of the Father. It's always our Mashiach, and people hear the Father through him. So it's not a strange concept. It's more like the uh, he's playing a part, and he's doing all the different acting jobs on it in this position, right? You can see the very same thing in the Shepherd of Hermas, but he doesn't appear. He comes to him as the assembly and then as a shepherd right so it's just as we're able to receive him we do and what he comes in in this form is to show us that he is like the light of the world who's also a man who's given all authority and he's bringing the offering that will be rejected and despised right and that is his, his main work here over his right shoulder and then it says, and on the crown on his head, three shepherds are seen shackled with 12 shackles. That's the three patriarchs and the 12 tribes. It's pretty simple. The shackles of gold and silver represent the redeemed, right? Those that are tried like gold are those that are refined in the furnace, like Job, also mentioned in Sirach, and the Chokma Shalomo, or Wisdom of Solomon. And those are the ones that are suffering for righteousness snake that do not sin. If you know how gold works, you have to completely melt it and filter out the dross, right? But it's completely melted in the process. Silver is a different creature. Its impurities are stuck with it, and you have to hold it in the flame just so long until the impurities sloth off. And once you perfectly see your own reflection in the silver, it's pulled out of the fire. And those are the two types of redeemed that we have that are mentioned. All right. And the voice of the lamb was heard, great and dreadful, like the voice of a lion roaring over his prey. He's called the lion of the tribe of Yahudah. And the, the voice of the lion roaring is also mentioned in Second Baruch, in the parable of the forest and the vine. I re if I recall correctly. So there's a few places that you can also read that. I'll put the, it in the commentary when we get to that point. And it says, and this is the key part. This is what ties directly into the revelation or to the woes of revelation. Revelation takes what would happen soon after his advent and, and the giving of those things. And then this vision is what would happen at his advent until his second coming. So you're going to see all of that alluded to here in a, in a bit. But it says, woe unto me, woe unto me, woe unto me. My image has been diminished. <clears throat> the first woe culminated with the coming of Constantine's Byzantine army and the enforcement of the Nicolaitan Catholic Christianity, enforcing the Trinity doctrine, the keeping of the Christ Mass on December 25th, the communion as a or the 
transfiguration or transmutation. I forgot what that was called. I'm sorry. Where they believe that they turn the wafer and wine into the actual body and blood of our Mashiach and then consume it. Um, all of those practices are, are the mixture that was mentioned here, but it literally diminished his image. And if you watch the videos from the anti Mashiach for dummies, it goes into great detail about each woe and how that culminated in history. His image was when they changed that and enforced it by the sword. Okay. His refuge being lost was the second woe. The second woe started after the first one with the Byzantine Empire and the Scorpions, but it culminated in the coming of Wycliffe and his translation into English. If you look through, in particular in the Psalms, but if you just do a word study for refuge or my refuge throughout scripture, you're going to find that the refuge of both the people and our Mashiach is literally the name of Yahuwah, my refuge and strength, the one in whom I trust. And it was with the culmination of the Wycliffe translation, which was taken from the Latin Vulgate and translated into the perverted Hebrew of the time called English, right? He had removed the name because they didn't use the name and they used the uh, Yusus, but the, he translated it as J for the I in the Latin. And Germanic J was a Yod, it was a Y. It still had the Y sound at first and later changed for it, for English speakers. But, um, he had J, H, because the H was on a phonetic that was in Latin, but it was originally in that word. He had J, H, E, S, U, S. Um, <clears throat> that word in particular, we'll get to in just a moment, but it took away Yahuwah, it took away Yahushua, it took away the refuge of our inner being and our Mashiach, which was mentioned right here. And that culminated in 1390, which was seen in the stars and foretold in Revelation as well. And then the third woe, my lot and destiny has turned me over to my spoilers, and I was defiled until evening by the touch of impurity. This began at the bloodiest battle in the Civil War for America, the blood, Battle of Antietam, where over 22,000 men were slain. Uh, if, again, you have to study Revelation carefully, I highly recommend everybody watch those videos. There's a lot of things that are not accurate about some of the things that the gentleman mentions in it, but what he shares about Revelation is absolutely spot on because it's in the stars for for the most part, he shows you exactly where it is in the stars and what it culminates to. There might be some contention with his later things because he's promoting stuff that isn't necessarily accurate. And he's talking about things that aren't fulfilled completely yet. But the things that he's revealing that have been shown absolutely line up with this. And at the Battle of Antietam, you had had the remnant of the children of Yahuwah who had fled the... Babylonian captivity of Rome, who would not stay in with their own people and left religious persecution to the new world. It was foretold as the woman going off in the wilderness with the eagle's wings and having a, a, a place prepared for her for a time. At this point, that remnant was being lost. It was turned over to his enemies. And it was after this battle and after the civil war where half a million Americans had taken, had lost their lives, that Rome had taken over so covertly our country and started perverting it. And it's from that point that we have been handed over to his spoilers because we're his body and defiled. That's exactly what you see going on today, even to today. This is, and it came to pass when the voice of the lamb was over and behold, a man dressed in linen came with three branches of vine and 12 palms 
in his hand. If you remember, okay, so this is again, the man dressed in linen with a golden band around his waist is throughout the common scriptures. He, that is our Mashiach that appears to men. He also appears with or as the esteem of Yahuwah, depending. <clears throat> and I mentioned that because when you go to like Exodus 20 or you find in some of the foretellers where it says the Kabod Yahuwah appeared to him. The esteem of Yahuwah is the one who was on the top, the top of Mount Sinai mm -hmm. speaking to the children. And that was our Mashiach. Right. So he says the three branches of vine. Again, like the three patriarchs where he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And then the 12 palms represent the 12 tribes that obtained victory because the palm branch is the branch for victory. And that also alludes to when he came, as he was riding into Yerushalayim on a donkey and a colt, because he's the truth that came to them with the stubborn people that wouldn't listen, both the original, the mother, and then the cult of it, the, the offspring after the Babylonian captivity. And the truth rode them both into the city, while the believers laid down their garments and the palm branches for him to go over, so he was not going on bare ground. All of this is alluding to the truth of things as it was reflected, if you can see these pictures, okay? This says, and he took the lamb from the hand of the sun and put the crown on its head and the vine branches and palms on his heart. That's pretty simple. And what, what he's talking about here, this is the man or Mashiach saying, what have you here in purity that you have placed in purity or that you've hewed yourself a place in impurity and in my covenant. So the man dressed in linen, the one who made the covenant, is the one that's saying, What's, what are you doing with this mixture, right? This might seem a little odd because you're looking at him. This is, Again, this is our Mashiach talking to our Mashiach about our Mashiach here. But this is all the vision for the benefit of Gad to share with posterity about the conditions of what we're going to have happening, okay? So it's just like what he said when he came, when the assembly appeared to Hermas, he came as he needed him, or in all the ways that he appeared to his children throughout time in every place and manner. He did it as it was necessary for their benefit. <clears throat> but then he says, and I heard the lamb's shepherd saying, there is a place for the pure, not for the impure with me, for I am a set apart Elohim, and I do not want the pure on, or the impure only the pure, though both are creations of my hands and my eyes are equally open on both. But there is an advantage to the abundance of purity over the abundance of impurity, just as there is an advantage of a man over a shadow. Right? He's explaining, and I'm sure you guys can see this. Those that stayed true to him that were pure had benefit they were helped they were successful and overcame their enemies anything that happened they were it was fixed and he studiously went to bat for those who studiously stood for the truth because they reaped what they sowed but not everyone was walking right and most of them did not have his ruach active in them the children were darkened in their comprehensions and only select few the kings the kohanim and the foretellers were anointed with the Ruach and had, if you will, were endowed with intelligence. And that's what he's alluding to here. You mix the pure with the impure, or you willingly do evil, it bars you from intelligence, comprehension, chokmah, knowledge, or basically what he's saying is it separates you from the truth. He is these things. It was what you can find alluded to throughout the Proverbs and the epistles. Then he goes on to give the, the example of a man is better than the shadow that he makes because he's the one that's actually of substance and the shadow doesn't come except by him, all right? He's alluding to these things but in the same manner that our Mashiach, the truth, having the, the Ruach is the substance, okay? The rest of it is not. But right here it says, for all gates of intelligence are turned around since the death of the eight branches of the vine. 
I have not found a single reference outside of what came to my mind on this matter. And that was that our Mashiach is, right, he's the vine and we're the branches. So if he is the vine and he is love, then what stems from that would be the fruits of that. And I'd had the comprehension come to me that this was love and the fruits of the Ruach. So I do that again. So in gates, the gates of intelligence are turned around since the death of love amongst brethren and the fruits being manifest in them, which is absolutely true. And you'll find later in this writing where Dawid alludes to these things in a different manner. He says, hearing is like a root. The doing of the action is like, the deed is like the root. The doing of it is like the seed. Therefore, or uh, I'm sorry, I'm messing that up. He alludes to these things as watering a plant and being active in doing them as fruitful growing of it instead of being a soggy, worthless seed that's just cast away. Which is just like it alludes to, the doing of these things brings comprehension, right? It says that in the Psalms, it mentions it in the Proverbs, and throughout the Apostolic Constitutions, he makes it very clear it's the willing evil of both Satan, demons, and men that bring them to ignorance, to not be able to comprehend the truth. And it says, as is found in words of righteousness in the true book, but because of the wanderings of the sheep and their rest and divisions, intelligence is stopped up until I do greatly in keeping favor. And that was stopped up until he came, but he came to pour out favor upon favor. And he came greatly keeping favor by pouring out the Ruach on all flesh by his death and ascension, in which intelligence was no longer stopped up. So, Ab William, you can see how these are all tying together here. And then it says, and I saw that impurity was driven from the moon or kingdom and was given to the hand of consuming wrath, ground finally to dust and scattered by the daily wind. The, this is alluding to what you can find with what happened with the children. After the golden calf incident, Moshe came down, the covenant tablets were broken, and he ground up the idol burned it in the furnace and scattered the ashes amongst the, the waters. And then he had everyone for Yahuwah to me. All the sons of Louis repented, and then they went through and took a sword to every man, his neighbor, brother, husband, you know, whatever. And you see the idolaters were the ones that got killed there. You don't know that for certain, doesn't mention it all. But when you get to the instructions in the book of Numbers about what a man is supposed to do when a ruach of jealousy comes over him, he's to take his wife, go to the Kohen, announce these things, and the curse, the curses are supposed to be written down and scraped off into water. The woman's supposed to recite a certain thing, saying that she did not do such and such, and drink it. And if she's telling the truth, She'll be prospered, nothing will happen, and she'll be able to have a child for her reward of continuance and not being untrustworthy to her husband. But if she had been found to have been an adulteress, her belly would swell, her thigh would wither, and everyone would know, and it'd be an evident sign of her infidelity, and she would be cursed because of it. So um, that was the bitter waters that were drank because of jealousy, and that kind of thing was what was alluded to there. And what's alluded to right here, the impurity mixed with his people in this world today is what's going to be consumed in his wrath, which is what we're, we've been going through for quite some time now. If, again, you look at the antique Mashiach for dummies videos, we are currently in the vials of wrath or the saucer bowls of wrath being poured out on his on the world before his return. There's, there's no other way around that you can we're in the reign of darkness right now where the darkness is being poured out on the throne 
of the beast and on the rain. It was poured out on the throne of the beast with the coming of John Paul II, the little horn, right? And he was an actor, but I didn't know all the, the details about it before. I don't really want to talk about it right now. But what he did, and then what came from that Vatican Council II, the continuation of the Reformation with the ecumenical movement, all this stuff happened with that and then spread. And right now we have the darkness being poured out on the reign of the beast or the kingdom of the anti mashiach which is why you have deception, lies, confusion, misinformation, propaganda, and lack of truth throughout governments of the world today. That's why there's so much confusion. That's why people are seeing so much crazy stuff going on. It's the darkness being poured out on the reign of the beast. But his children will have light because we, we stay with the, the light of the world. Okay. And it says, and the day burns as a furnace, like the uh, the sun scorching men with intense heat so that they blaspheme but don't repent of their works, as it's mentioned, right? To transfer impurity and to erase the transgressions. And the transgressions here would be what Rome initiated. The co-equal, co-eternal trinity is blasphemous error. Yahuwah the Father alone is Elohim and unique, and all things are because he exists and did not come into being. Right? Our Mashiach said he's greater, not that, oh, I'm equal to. That's a lie. It's easily known. <clears throat> that has to be repented of. Christmas, Easter, Lent, Mardi Gras, Halloween, every Valentine's Every pagan festival coming from the mystery religions that was amalgamated, it's all forms of witchcraft, all forms of idolatry have to be repented of, or else we're going to continue having demons have jurisdiction over us, and we're going to continue being under the judgment of the Almighty. There is no other way around that. You're either in his kingdom or you're in Satan's. And when we get to chapter 14 here, It'll make that even more clear. There's only one exception for a sinner to get out of jail card for free. And that's if you fast and keep the day of atonement, which is, again, keeping his festivals and not the world's. <clears throat> but then it says, and the lamb was put on the moon forever and ever. There's an online version that said sun here, but that's not what it actually reads. It says the moon. And while you know, moon calendar keepers might like the idea there and jump to it and think things that aren't true. If you realize the moon represents the kingdom and our Mashiach is going to inherit the rain that will not yield its sovereignty to another, it fits perfectly and makes sense because that's what it represents. Okay. This is, and the lamb took of the pure that had been mixed with the impure and brought it as a shalom offering sacrifice before the altar of El Shaddai, jealous Yahuwah of hosts. That would be his, the lamb rejected and despised, right? He is the head, we are the body. The ones perfected would be like their master. And the ones that were pure, the ones that were perfected during this time were the martyrs. Not everyone was a martyr, but those that are, receive a greater reward you can find that in the common scriptures you can find that i mean prosperous are those who suffer for righteousness sake for theirs is the reign of the shamayim right guaranteed a place in the kingdom for such things in the shepherd of hermas in one of the similitudes where Mikael is giving a rod from a willow tree to which is representative of the law to every believer and to based on how they return those rods back to them is how they kept the Torah. Those that suffered and died for righteousness sake had fruitful burrows, leaves and fruits within, on their trees instead of just a rod. And they had a greater reward for it. <clears throat> this is 
And the lamb took of the pure that had been mixed with the impure and brought it as an offering to the Father. And that is those that are going to be in the first resurrection. And then we hear the song of the lamb. This is the song that's alluded to in Revelation, where you hear the song of Moshe, which a lot of people think is Deuteronomy 33 or 32. But it's, it's not. I think it's 33. But it's not that one. The song of Moshe is the song that he sang after the Reed Sea crossing. The song in Deuteronomy was Yahuwah's song that he put in his mouth that he told him to speak to the children. But this is the song of the Lamb, which is just like the song of Moshe, but a little more in depth. And you can see why the two go together in just a moment. Um, he says, and I heard the voice of the song of the Lamb saying, I shall give thanks unto you, Yahuwah, for though you were angry with me, you relented. For Yahuwah is my strength and song, and he is become my redeemer. I will sing unto Yahuwah. And for anyone who doesn't know, this, this word is amazing. The more you look at the letters, look at the words, there's so much you could do with just his, just his name that you can find so much truth in it. How our, our Mishiach says, I come in my father's name. He, he means that in every sense that he can possibly illu illuminate. What he's mentioned throughout the scriptures is what he means by what he says. But you have the way you can see these words, how it breaks down. There's tons of things to go to it. What I mentioned here is not all inclusive because we would be here too long, right? But uh, it's to encourage greater research or study on your part, asking more questions, praying to our Father for these things because he can reveal to anyone what's in his word if you ask him. This is what he wants. And that's what the key to the kingdom was that was given to Kepha that the gates of hell would not overcome is the revelation from the Father internally into the heart of a man. Anyways, Yahuwah means he who, as a, as a uh, prefix, the Yod is he will or he is, and then Hua is to cause it to be, to fall about. Right, so he who causes it to be, he who makes it so, and also he who destroys. Same word. But it says, I will sing unto Yahuwah, he who causes it to be, for he is highly exalted. The horse. The horse. So you have... Hasus, right? Jesus is Hasus. This is literally the horse in Hebrew. But just like you have Baal become Bel as they travel and the vowels change slightly, you had Hasus become Jesus. <clears throat> you can find the children in writing worshiping the horse as far back as the fall of Troy where the tribe of Dan was intermixed with other Greek peoples and fought against their own brothers, the Trojans, to sack that city. And they worshipped the horse um, during that time. You can find in, that is mentioned in the ancient history of Caledonia. You can find in the history of Romanism, page 34, how the Hebrews in dispersion, known as paganized Celts, or Gaelic-speaking peoples and Germans, or Scythians, if you will. The Germans and the Celts, when adopting the Nicolaitan Catholic Christianity from Rome, already called on Tyrannus, a three-headed false mighty one, and Jesus. So the Nicolaitans just adopted that name, and it became Eosus in Latin. And then that horse was taken by William Tydell, or I'm sorry, Wycliffe. Tydell translated one as well, but this is Wycliffe's translation was what was talked about in Revelation, in the stars, and culminated in 1390 translation, where he took Eosus from the Latin Vulgate and translated it as this word right here, J-H-E-S-U-S. -E and that was literally 
the horse from Hebrew, which the scriptures talk about the horse is a vain means of safety. Neither does it rescue any by its great power. It snorts at the sound of battle, doesn't scoff at the sound of the ram's horn which charging towards that battle. These are all allusions to what's going on. But he makes it very clear that the horse is a vain means of deliverance. And right here, he says, the horse and his rider, which would be Satan, he has thrown into the sea of reeds. And that's what this is all about. That name that's unprofitable is going to be swallowed up and his children are going to turn to him in truth. He says, rise up intelligence, rise up power, rise up kingship, rise up majesty and esteem, rise up to help Yahuwah. For El has delivered one who had strayed and obliterated the impurity from the earth. And if you want to know how he did that, because the horse and his rider he threw into the sea of reeds okay if you remember the reed in the hand was like those trusting in mitzrayim these are different illusions pointing back to that kind of thing all right now he says for he fought my fight and brought into the light my righteousness by his help and the light of our Mashiach's righteousness is his obedience to the truth and doing what's right. Revealing the name, not hiding it. My help comes from Shaddai who made Shemaim and earth. Amen, or truly, who is like unto you, esteemed in set apartness, but not in impurity. For you are great over all, raised over all you spoke and acted now this is the mashiach talking about the father because he's the one that is the most high okay there is nothing greater it says you for you declared the end from the beginning and you sealed everything with your words and turned my heart and tormented me for your seal is on me, my master, and these three branches of vine and twelve palms that are on my heart. So again, our Mashiach, as the Lamb is speaking, the seal is alluded to later on as well, but you find out that that's the Ruach in the recognitions of Clement, the Syriac version of it that has the ten missing chapters from book three. Kepha explains very clearly that the Ruach is the seal and glyph of, their, of the power of the two. Just as the Father brought forth the word from his bosom through which he made all things, our Mashiach speaks and it is. Because he only does what he sees and he only, he ref, he's like a, uh, it's explained in the recognitions there that as the substance of a body produces a shadow, so much more the fact that the Father is would produce the Mashiach. Okay? And then as you can think how a shadow reacts to a body, that's what you can see in history with what our Mashiach does through creation, both in every work that he does and every manifestation that he appears, he reflects the truth as shown by the Father through him. And I'll give you one more example to chew on for that. The father sent the Mashiach to deliver the children, and as that was done, the Mashiach sent Moshe to deliver the children, but because he needed help, he had Moshe send for Aaron, who sent to deliver the children. It was just the pattern, like a hand in the glove, hand in the glove, hand in the glove pattern, because he's consistent with himself. Ob willing, that makes sense. All right, so the three branches we talked about, the three branches of vine are the three patriarchs, and then the 12 palms represent the victors of the 12 tribes, right? You gave me grandeur, speaking of our Mashiach, who is exalted to the right hand of the Father. You erased vanity to fear man, which he had no fear of any man. And he taught us not to be afraid of any man, but to fear the one who can destroy both body and inner being right and you gave me 
a pure heart forever. There's no other in the creation that can say that but our Mashiach. For that I will praise you at all times and thank you among the nations. For you have redeemed me greatly for my king and did favor to Dawid, the anointed, which means beloved Hamashiach, right? And his seed forever and ever. And here's another instance real quick I, where I can show you the truth is true in every context. This means that he did favor for the literal Dawid and his seed, his posterity, forever, which is true. Our Mashiach came from him, and all his children were, were in positions of uh, leadership or could be in the world. Um, but it's also true of our Mashiach. He did favor for beloved and for his seed forever and ever. And if you remember, his seed is the word. And his word is going to remain forever. And I heard a voice crying from Shemaim saying, You are my son. You are my firstborn, the firstborn of all creation. You are my first fruit, the first fruits of the resurrection. Have I not brought you from the crossing? This is from Shiloh wholeheartedly to be my daily delight. And this is an allusion to what you can find in, uh, what was it, Proverbs chapter 8, where it talks about, I, Hokma have dwelt with insight. I have found knowledge, foresight. He goes on to say, Yahuwah possessed me or created me, the beginning of his works, right? As the first of his works of old, before he did anything else, he brought me forth. And he mentions that I was his delight day by day, or as you can say, I was his daily delight, directly quoting from right there. <clears throat> so you can see this one actually came first, and Shalomo would have had that knowledge when he made that proverb. It says, but you, meaning our Mashiach, have thrown my presence away and dressed up the impure with the pure. And that is why all these things have happened to you. I, it mentions in the recognitions by Kepha, when he's explaining that the father is not his own son, that he did not contend with himself. And that might seem a little odd because where do you find anywhere in scripture Anywhere in the original covenant writings, anywhere in the Besora or renewed covenant writings, where do you find it mentioned that our, our Mashiach contended with his father? I, I can't recall a single place that does that overtly. You can get a allusion to these things if you think he is our head, we are his body, we're, we've been rebellious, and he's taken on our punishment which is exactly what this is alluding to. And then you can tie that back into Yahuwah himself on the base of the mount, or on Mount Sinai, when he's talking with Moshe. The first time he brought him up, he gave him the book of Yobelim. He gave him the, uh, the truth, the original covenant, the right rulings to give to the children, and then the book of Yobelim. After that time, after the 40 days and 40 nights, he says, you get down and go, you know, you leave me alone. Let me wipe them out because they're, they've done evil. They've broken my covenant. They're done. I'll make you a great nation. And Moshe intercedes for the people and says, please forgive them their trespass, their inequities. And he hears his voice for, he hears Moshe's voice for their sake and passes over their transgression. But he, is going to pay the price for it now because he's the one that walked through the, the parts and made the covenant with the father to keep these things for Abraham and his descendants so that he would be sure of the promises given to him. Now, Ob willing, that will start to make more sense. And you can see the contention that the father had against his son for allowing the impure to be mixed with the pure. And the whole point was to 
the dross is never going to be acceptable. You have to repent. But if you repent, you're taken in. And he's paid the punishment for that. However, throughout history and time, you've had the pure and the impure mixed together because the two are in this world and not everyone is going to do what's right. But that's why at the end of these things, he separates the pure that have been mixed with the pure and brings them as the offering. And they're the ones that get the reward. But right here, it says, but you have thrown my presence away and dressed up the impure with the pure. And that is why all these things have happened to you. And who is like unto you among all creatures on earth? For in your shadow lived all these, and by your wounds they were healed. In the shadow of his wings, it's mentioned to in fourth Ezra that he's tried to gather them as a chick gathers, or as a hen gathers a chicks under his wings, but they would not, right? He says that when he's walking in the flesh. He says that in fourth Ezra, and it says that in the Psalms, where it's under their, his wings that we take refuge. You also find in Yeshiyahu that uh, it's by his wounds, Yeshiyahu 53, by his wounds we are healed. And then also you find that in Lamentations chapter 4, that it's the Mashiach Yahuwah who is trapped in their nets, in whose shadow we seek to dwell amongst the nations. So it's not an inconsistent theme, but these things are not accurately translated all the time in English. If you look at Lamentation chapter 4, it says Mashiach Yahuwah. In Hebrew, it does not say the Mashiach of Yahuwah. Okay? In that same way, you find a direct reference of Mashiach Yahuwah in the book of Luke at the birth of our Mashiach when the messengers announce his presence to the or announce his birth to the shepherds. They say very clearly, there has been born this in this Yom in the city of Dawid, a deliverer, Mashiach Yahuwah. <clears throat> and that's not that he's his own father, but he was literally given the name above every name. And he's come in the name of Yahuwah from the beginning. It's just in the course of time, he was given the name Yahushua in the earth because Yahuwah is the one who delivers. Yahuwah is the one who saves. It says, for that, consider well that which is before you. And because you have fulfilled the words of the shepherd, all the days you have been in the sun, and you did not leave them, Therefore, all this honor shall occur to you. This is something that I've talked to my children about before. It's the reason why we're made in his image. The image of Elohim is free will, a creative mind and the ability to do what you will. Our Mashiach also has free will. Otherwise, he would be an automation and there is no reward for that. There's no reward for the sun for doing its duty when it can't do otherwise. This is also explained by Kepha when he's disputing with Simon the Magician about if all things are the way Yahuwah wills or not. And he says, that's, there's a stipulation here. Everything is as he wills for those that can't be otherwise in their nature. But to those whom he's given free will, they do not always do what he would like but there will be an accounting for that. Our Mashiach, given free will, willingly chose to submit his, his will to the Father. He did not do his own will, but laid down his and did the will of the one who sent him. And because of that, all that he's at the right hand of the Father, given the name above every name, given all authority, every benefit he's had was because of his disposition. And that's why he tells us, follow me and you'll sit on my throne with me. I, I have a place for you if you do the thing I'm doing. Because this is my reward, I'm going to give you the same benefit. But we have to be partakers and willingly give our all for the one who made us in the same way he did. <clears throat> <clears throat> Verse 
then it's directed on who was receiving this right and the one dressed in linen came down and touched him and he said ahie asher ahie i am that which i am this is our mashiach and he's the one that came to moshe saying i am take off your sandals it's set apart ground this is the one that appeared to yahushua as the prince of the host of yahua in armor that said take off your sandals you're on hollow ground right set apart ground that our mashiach is the one who said i am that which i am So, of willing, more people will be able to see just who's talking and who's not, because he he didn't make these things confusing. The Father cannot be perceived by a man. He cannot be heard. He's not a, in the physical sense. He's spiritual. He's perceived in the mind, in the Ruach. These things are mentioned as far back as the book of Hanok and directly spoken of by his taught ones after he came. All right. So the rest of this is pretty straightforward, right? But right here, he says, for in those days, right, they shall not be called Yaakov, but Yisrael, for in their remnant, remnant, no inequity is found, for they belong entirely to Yahuwah. And this is alluded to in the foretellers when they would call themselves by Yaakov and name themselves after the name of Yisrael, and they would all belong to Yahuwah, it says, from the least until the greatest. It's also mentioned in chapter, I believe it's chapter one of Yobelim, and again at the death of Abraham, which I believe is chapter, oh, I don't want to get that wrong, 16 maybe, chapter 12 is where he receives the Hebrew language. But when he dies, and also at the beginning of the book, it's alluded to what would happen with the children. They would turn away and go perverted, but then they would start learning. They would start doing, they would repent wholeheartedly, and consequently, they would stop suffering calamities. Their lives would extend upward to a thousand years, and they would no longer have problems because they were no longer doing evil. That's what we have as a goal to work towards right now. Um, and those are, so we got three witnesses of these things right here. And then it goes on and he says, and these words will be unto you, meaning these words right here from this book will be unto Gad, a restorer of life and Ruach. In the very same way, in the Testaments of the 12 patriarchs, it mentions that when their remnants would start repenting and doing the things that they would, should, that was when the patriarch's words were to be a restore of life unto them, and they would get benefit. And um, it doesn't directly mention it anywhere uh, overtly, but there were some that were resurrected when our Mashiach came as part of the first fruits. It's mentioned in Matanyahu that when he rose, there were many that rose with him and appeared in the city. Right, So he took his captivity captive and he gave gifts to men, meaning those bound in sin he brought with him. The ones of the first covenant that stayed true, he, he resurrected and took with him. And then he's coming back for the others when he comes. But he was promised that this restoration of life when these words would be restored. And like I was telling you, we just got this translation in English within our lifetimes as far as I'm aware. Before then, it wasn't. And then he gave him the token by telling him the future of what would soon happen in his very life, which exactly is what was happened. And that's something that only our Mashiach has ever done in Scripture. Or you have his messengers that specifically are known as messengers telling people things that would happen. But they get it from him because he's the revealer of what will be. Um. That one's pretty straightforward, so let me get just one moment. All right, everyone. So uh, we don't really have any questions or answers to go over. I thought that was pretty well put out. Um, if anyone that's listening to this has any questions, I know that was a lot of information. Uh, not all of it was in the footnotes there yet, 
but I encourage you, if you have any questions about any point in this chapter that I've mentioned, if you'd like to see the other references, please feel free to ask. I don't mind. And then if you have any references that also allude to these things or might contradict them from scripture or go along with it, please share. I also don't mind. It's how we grow. So thank you for your time. And everyone have a Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov. Wonderful week ahead. We will see you next week. Shalom.